I'm grateful for the chance to talk uh, about this movie some more. Uh, grateful to the organizers. Thankful to you f for preferring just for this one evening uh, film to football. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful because uh, Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards is perhaps it provided the occasion for the only knockdown ch screaming match of a fight I've had since graduate school. When this movie came out, my best friend from graduate school was visiting in western Massachusetts and I um, uh, got into a screaming match with him in our town's only coffee shop. Uh, he denounced me for a moron. I shouted that he was an idiot, and then I thought, oh my god, this is the Berkshires. They're going to call the cops. <laughs> uh, so I, we didn't get to finish that fight. It was, it was Viv Sony's contention that Inglorious Bastards, though technically immaculate, uh, was finally a rather juvenile exercise in revenge fantasy. Uh, so what I would like to do tonight is explain to you how and in what precise way Viv Sony is wrong. Uh, okay? Um, I, I don't really want to do anything fancy in, in some ways is all I'm saying. I, I just want to ask a few questions about the movie and then try to answer them. Uh, it's going to be harder, I think, to get the questions right than to get the answers right. The, the movie is so diabolically entertaining that we could all easily overlook how complicated a thing we've all seen. So I'm thinking that if we can just name the movie's complications, if we can lift out its puzzles, the answers might start taking care of themselves, okay? So my questions are three. First question. Is Inglorious Bastards a historical movie? Is it a period piece or not? In some sense, yeah, plainly, of course it is. It takes place at a specified moment in history, 1944. The story unfolds against the backdrop of a major world event, World War II. It transforms real historical personages into minor fictional characters, Hitler, Goebbels, and the rest and it freely intermixes these real people with characters of its own invention. So those are the hallmarks of historical fiction in the mode of Walter Scott or Tolstoy. Walter Scott's Waverly features the real Scottish prince who in the middle of the 18th century tried to seize the throne of England and Scotland. War and Peace, in turn, actually has Napoleon as a character, uh, a fairly central character even, at least for part of the novel. But there's an obvious problem with this comparison, which is that Tarantino's movie completely rewrites the history it has chosen to recount. And I can, I can already hear, long distance, some of my colleagues back at Williams murmuring, but wait, historical fiction always, in myriad subtle ways, rewrites the history that it recounts. And they're right. But Inglorious Bastards isn't subtle about this. It doesn't even pretend to authentic historical insight. It gleefully concocts an alternate history in a manner that is impossible to overlook. Can, can we be really clear about this? American Jews did not storm the Nazi high command and gun Hitler down in an act of heroic retribution. This is not historical fiction in the usual sense but rather a kind of fantasia or historical reverie. And the movie doesn't make any effort to hide that. Not even in Tolstoy does Napoleon complete the march to Moscow. But then this is where things get really strange. So the movie is a flight of fancy on a historical subject. OK, I think I can take that on board because I've seen that before. In, in science fiction circles, these alternate histories have become a genre in their own right. What would England look like if the 20th century had stayed Catholic, if that is there had never been a Protestant church in England? What would the world look like today if Europeans had been wiped out in the 14th century by the Black Death, a world without white people? I've always rather liked that one. Uh, or closest to the day's concerns, 
what would the U.S. look like now if Hitler had not been defeated? Those books all exist, and, and a lot more like them. Historical novels about histories that never happened. But then think about which event the movie has chosen to rescript. It doctors the end of World War II. And if we're going to think about that, then let us call to mind another obvious thing. America actually defeated the Germans in World War II, or rather the Allies did. And Americans defeat the Nazis in the movie too, with some help from French resistors. You see why that's odd? I mean, it's not like the movie has taken a tale of American failure or hesitation and turned it into a story about American triumph. Try to imagine Inglorious Bastards as a Vietnam movie, and you'll begin to see what I mean. There was a period in the mid-1980s when Hollywood started churning out movies like Delta Force or the second Rambo joint in which the U.S. Army was granted some kind of magic do-over in Southeast Asia, right? In Rambo, Sylvester Stallone actually speaks the question, do we get to win this time? And his commanding officer responds, yes, Rambo, we get to win this time. You understand what's going on in a movie like that. You don't need me to explain it. The historical record, probably the better way to put that would be to say popular historical pseudo-memory, contains in reference to Vietnam all sorts of ambivalence, feelings of failure, complicity, shame. And, and those feelings are a, a, a breeding ground for compensatory fantasy. But Tarantino, Tarantino has scripted an alternative to D-Day. To D-Day, of all things. Which means he has replaced the most heroic moment in 20th century US history. A history that is already fully triumphalist, almost entirely devoid of ambivalence, with something even more triumphalist. But weirdly, ferociously so, he's, he scripted a fictional way of winning a war that the US won anyway. So what's going on? That's actually the first question. I have a second question that also involves the ways this is not a straightforward historical movie. I want to be careful here. Historical fictions are always complicated because they always required you to think at the same time about two different historical moments. If you're reading a historical novel, you need to think about when the book was set, but you also need to think about when the book was written. Right? So you might, you might think about Toni Morrison's Beloved, which I'm guessing is a, is a book a lot of people in this room have read. Okay, so that book is set in the 1870s but it was written in the 1980s. And a person might ask, well, what's the difference between a book that was written in the 1870s and set in its own present, like uh, maybe Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd, and one that was written later but still set in the 1870s? That <laughs> second book, that's Beloved, has a historical shadow dimension that the first book doesn't have. Historical novels belong, as it were, to, to, to two historical moments at once. They're always implicitly putting two historical moments in front of you and asking you what connects them or, or, or what they share. So Beloved is a novel about America in the 19th century. It's about the aftermath of slavery. But it's also a novel of the 1980s, right? So the 1870s and the 1980s get held up next to each other uh, so that they can shed light on each other's quandaries and concerns. So if you want to understand Beloved, you have to understand both what Toni Morrison is saying about the past and what she's saying to her contemporaries. It's Reconstruction, and it's the Reagan era, and they're side by side. So same deal with Inglorious Bastards. Right? Tarantino was talking about this movie as early as 2001. He wrote different versions of the screenplay across the last decade. Two or three times he announced that he was going into production with the thing, only to change his mind. 
and then he finally began filming in October of 2008, a month before the Obama-McCain election, if you want to think of it that way. So this movie is about 1944, but we can also think of it as pretty much the last movie of the Bush administration. A war movie, and don't lose sight of this, which recasts World War II as a settling of scores. And it's also a Western. I'm sure that wasn't lost on anybody. What does it mean to, to make a movie uh, late in the last decade that is set in the 1940s? And what I want to hang on to is a simple observation that, that whatever else this movie is, and I think it's lots of other things, it's also a Western. Right? So there's, there's an opening scene, uh, uh, of which we might eventually see a still, um, that, that has a, a, a French farmer right, living in uh, what a person could mistake for a, for a, for a frontiersman's shack. And then there's a, there's a shootout in the film, right, in a saloon where desperados are drinking whiskey. Uh, lots of little uh, uh, Wild West business of that order. So who thinks about war as a Western? Well, six days after 9-11, George Bush stood up in front of the press corps and said, and I will, I will, I think I can get this verbatim, said, I want justice. And there's an old poster at West, I recall, that said wanted, dead or alive. Okay, so, so far so good. But the point I'm after is that Inglorious Bastards is actually more complicated than that. Historical fictions are always complicated, and the movie is more complicated still. Why? Because it's so obviously stitched together out of parts from other movies. I mean, I just said it's a Western, right? Now, we know that this is what Tarantino likes to do. He's got a, a mashup aesthetic. So that opening scene, it's borrowed from John Ford. Right? And the scene where the, the French Jewish beauty and the young Nazi hero kill each other? Do you remember this towards the end of the film? That's ripped from a John Woo movie. Now again, movies and novels are always borrowing from other movies and novels, so maybe you're thinking, big deal. There it is. There it is. Almost a timber shack. And there it is pretty recognizably John Woo. Uh, so maybe you're thinking, big deal. But most movies and novels take some pains to cover their tracks. They don't want you to spot their borrowings. They invite you to sink into the story so that you can trick yourself into thinking that you're watching the past unfold organically in front of you. And Tarantino, Tarantino won't let you simply sink into the story. He won't hide his sources. Rather, he flaunts them. So the most obvious example of that, the most obvious example of that, I think, in Inglorious Bastards, is this. The reason for Hugo Stiglitz's celebrity among German soldiers is simple. As a German enlisted man, he killed 13 Gestapo officers. Now look, that Sam Jackson you just heard in the voiceover with, a, with an underlay of Boom Chicka Wah Wah, and every time you hear those pimped out cadences in this movie, and you only hear them a couple times, you get airlifted briefly out of 1944 and deposited in the mid-70s instead. So Sam Jackson, but Sam Jackson in his incarnation as Latter-day Soul Brother. That moment, complete with visual overlay, is the single most intrusive moment in the film. It's the invisible incursion of another film genre into the World War II movie, but it's hardly the only one. There's the spaghetti western soundtrack, which provides an ongoing temporal counterpoint to the action, or there's the title. I'm not sure if anybody here has bothered to watch the 1978 Italian movie from which this title has been filched. Don't bother. Uh, but let me say clearly, it bears absolutely no resemblance to the movie Tarantino actually made. 
well, the movie that you saw is in no way a remake of that other movie. But then knowing that should help us see how programmatic Tarantino's retro aesthetic is. He wants you to think his movie is a remake even when it isn't a remake. He wants you to think his movie is less original than it actually is. So in, in the event, the, 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 the title Inglorious Bastards functions something like an all-purpose footnote. It doesn't do much more than point you broadly to that entire body of late 60s and 70s era trash movies that we all know Tarantino loves. And the music does the same thing, and so does Sam Jackson. I mean, I almost expected to see like John Travolta as Hitler, <laughs> knowing his commitment to the period. So the movie does, doesn't just whisk us back to 1944, and it doesn't even really whisk us back to its alternate reality in 1944. Rather, it forces us to contemplate 1944 through a scrim of other movies. And I want us to think of this as an almost uh, geological act of historical layering. That's how Inglorious Bastards is different from an ordinary historical fiction. There aren't just two historical moments in play, there are at least three. So my second question, why in 2009 make a 70s style movie about 1944? So one quick point to make, just in passing, because it will be important to some people's experience of the movie. This might be a trash movie, and it might rewrite history in preposterous ways. But its use of historical detail is nonetheless meticulous. Uh, the movie's, I think, really evident precision begins with its attention to language. It's a trilingual movie for a start. And I can only speak to the movie's use of German because I don't have a good ear for French. But the German in the movie is utterly meticulous. It's, it's entirely unlike the Halt und Schnell school uh, that you get from, that you find in like, uh, the Hogan's hero style of World War II filmmaking. And, and beyond that, of course, forgive me, one, one other little adjustment. So, so beyond the, the actual care that's been taken in crafting the film's German, the movie is full of historical references that aren't in the least offhand. Uh, the references that are entirely knowing and apt. So Tarantino works in references to early 20th century German children's literature. He briefly introduces, as a character, a cat named Emil Jannings, who was a real German actor of the period, the first person to ever win an Oscar, and a prominent Nazi. And, and on and on and on. I, we, we could toss out 10 or 12 other um, acts of uh, feats, really, of historical erudition of that caliber. Now, if you're in a position to appreciate those details, which basically means if you're German, the experience of the movie has got to be all the more bewildering. The, the, the puzzles I've been describing intensify because in lots of ways, the movie actually seems unusually committed to 1944. The movie's historical knowledge, I mean, can't help but convey a certain respect for the, the, the raw data of the historical moment. And yet at the same time, 1944 is constantly slipping from sight in the movie. So that's my second question. My third question is easy to explain, though it's probably also the most important one. It all comes down to this, and let's hope for sound. My name is Susanna Dreyfus, and this is the face of Jewish. Do you get what's going on there? 
I can imagine a person being keyed up enough at the sweet side of all those Nazis getting killed to overlook the second thing that's going on in that scene. Not a second event, but a second equally plausible way of describing that one event. The movie is showing a Jewish woman wreaking vengeance upon Germans. Okay, clear enough. But it's also showing a filmmaker killing her own audience. That's amazing. And serious thinking about the movie, I think, has got to start there. We need to think hard about the conditions under which at least some of us saw this movie. If you were lucky enough to see Inglorious Bastards during its original run, and so not on DVD, then you sat in a movie theater and watched people in a movie theater get wiped out. You might have been rooting for Shoshana or for the Bastards, I know I was. I suspect everybody here was. But the people getting offed were, at the moment of their death, unmistakably like you. So the aspect of the movie that most leaps out, I think, is its extraordinary hostility towards the audience. So my third question is, why does Quentin Tarantino hate us so much? So those are my three questions. Why take the triumphalist American history of World War II and make it even more triumphalist? Why channel our perceptions of the 1940s via the 1970s? And why commit mass murder upon the audience? So now maybe some answers. Uh, Tarantino is on record as saying that Inglorious Bastards is his bunch of guys on a mission film, which would mean that it's a version of The Dirty Dozen or The Guns of Navarone. Now, like almost everything else that Tarantino says in interviews, I think that sentence is a lie or a trick, uh, which should become clear if you pause to consider how uninterested the movie is in the bastards as Nazi hunters. I mean, we see them hunting Nazis almost not at all. In fact, the Shoshana plot is entirely separate from the bastards plot and commands our attention every bit as intently. I'd like to say this isn't really a men on a mission movie, that this is first and foremost a revenge movie, and you might say in response, why can't it be both? And yeah, sure, it's both. But Tarantino has also decided to make nearly all the bastards Jewish, which means that the revenge framework actually spills over from the Shoshana plot and colonizes the men on a mission plot too. It's like the revenge movie is sucking the war movie into its field of gravity. Revenge is the common term that, that, that unites the two separate plots, is all I'm saying. Plus, we know that Tarantino is deeply engaged with revenge movies, which were a staple of the 70s grindhouse circuit that he so adores. So it's movies like Last House on the Left, and Death Wish, and Thriller in Grimm Film, or I Spit on Your Grave, or lots of other movies that I don't recommend you watch by yourself. Uh, Tarantino, you just, you just scan your memory, Tarantino's already made one epic revenge movie before this one that was Kill Bill. So we can't be all that surprised to see him returning to the form here. But if it's a revenge movie, it's an unusual one because it has that oddly doubled narrative. Not just one, but two revenge plots unspooling side by side and eventually converging though without either revenge party ever knowing about the other. And what you think is at stake in the revenge plot will depend in large part on whether you decide to emphasize the bastards or, or if you decide to emphasize Shoshana. So ask yourself which agent of revenge your heart favors. If you emphasize the bastards, then what really jumps out in the movie is the image of the Jewish tough guy. There's a word that's uh, common in Hebrew slang and that Hebrew has bequeathed to Israeli English, and that word is friar, which means something like pushover or sucker, and it's become one of the most distinctive Israeli insults. Nobody in Israel wants to be a friar. Nobody wants to be a pushover. My Israeli friends uh, boast proudly that the country has the world's highest incident of fatal car crashes, and I don't know if that's true, but I do know that my friends brag about it, and, and that really tells me all that I need to know. Uh, uh, the explanation they always give is that no Israeli in a car will ever back down 
and back down, of course, here means yield the right of way. So all I want to say is that uh, testosterone has become a very big deal in some corners of modern Jewish culture for reasons that are not hard to reconstruct. And you could think of Inglorious Bastards as playing into this by projecting an IDF-style masculinity back into the 1940s. And, and that curious notion obviously goes back to one of the classic nagging questions in the historiography of the Second World War. Why didn't European Jews resist the fascists in larger numbers? If Inglorious Bastards generates a compensatory fantasy, then of course, it's got to be there. It's not fantasizing about Americans winning the war, it's fantasizing about Jews winning the war. And this is a fantasy it shares roughly with other tough Jew movies, like uh, Defiance, which came out at roughly the same time and features Daniel Craig as the bear Jew. Those movies ask the question, what if the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had spread? What if there had already been a Mossad to counteract the SS? So here's the thing. If we focus instead on Shoshana, the movie is going to look rather different. Shoshana is, of course, also Jewish and also tough, so we can, to some extent, just fold her into the last point. But only to some extent. Why? Because this is obviously an image of Jewish, Jewish machismo, but this is not. What I mean is that Shoshana's method of taking revenge is so different from the bastards that it raises some new issues for us to think about. The explosive movie screen does not trigger the same set of real world associations that the American soldiers do. Shoshana gets her revenge through film. She makes a movie passing judgment on the fascists, whom she then immolates in the flames of burning nitrate reels. So it's not just that we see a filmmaker killing Nazis. It's as though film itself were able to strike fascists dead. There are, I think, two different ways of clarifying what Tarantino is up to here. First, one way to understand the film Shoshana makes and that we eventually see is as Tarantino's homage to post-war French cinema and to the kind of anti-fascist film that people like Bunuel were making even before the war. She makes a guerrilla film on the cheap, a technically rough, experimental, low-budget, and anti-fascist film. It's as though Tarantino were trying to engineer a history in which Binwell never left for Mexico, or as, though he, as if he were trying to backdate Godard by about 15 years. The movie literally stages a showdown between fascist film and the anti-fascist film of the post-war left. And this alone licenses us to say that Tarantino is deeply, deeply invested in the possibility of an anti-fascist film. I mean, he has just given us as hero an anti-fascist movie director. Now, now I think would be the moment to, for me to point out that he and his associates often seem to think that trash cinema is the continuation in the US of anti-fascist film. Uh, let, let me show you what I mean by that, because I realize that may not be intuitively clear. I'm going to show you the fake trailer that Robert Rodriguez made for what was initially a non-existent 70s drive-in movie called Machete. Uh, then having made this trailer, he liked this non-existent movie so much that he went out and made it. Uh, so this is something you can now actually see, but, but at, at the beginning was meant to exist only in the, the two-minute form borrowed from an alternate universe. Here it is. They called him Machete. $70 a day for yard work. 100 for roofing. Get in. 125 for septic. Sewage. Have you ever killed anyone before? As you may know, illegal aliens such as yourself are being forced out of our country at an alarming rate for the good of both our people. Our new senator must die. And for that, I will pay you $150,000. 
he was given an offer he couldn't refuse. I cost the most. Because I'm the best there is. Set up, double crossed, and left for dead. I took a vow of peace. And now you want me to help you kill all these men? Yes, bro. I mean, Padre. I'll see what I can do. He knows the score. Where are my wife and daughter? He gets the women. And he kills the bad guys. Oh, shit. You knew that a Mexican day laborer is a goddamn federal! But they soon realize... He's coming after us. They just fucked with the wrong Mexican. Action. Suspense. Emotion. Please, Father, have mercy. God has mercy. I don't. If you're gonna hire Machete to kill the bad guy, you better make damn sure the bad guy isn't you. Machete. It's really hard to go back to an academic lecture uh, <laughs> after, after that. But look, you see what's up there. I, you, don't, you, don't need, you don't need a professor to come in and, and tell you what's up there. An army of illegal immigrants wielding the third world's iconic weapon rises up against white bosses and politicians. It's that straightforward. But the thing is, there's plenty of precedents on that front. One of the key black exploitation movies is this film from 1976 called Brotherhood of Death, which is about a group of black Vietnam vets who return to the US and start using what the army taught them against the Klan. All right, so we know that, that Tarantino and Rodriguez are fixated on grindhouse movies, but what they're too cool to say out loud, but I'm dorky enough to spill it, is that they basically think of Grindhouse as a people's cinema, right? Crude and insurgent. A precious collection of movies about black people taking on the Klan and women turning the knife back against the men who attack them and kung fu masters sticking up for Native Americans. So what I'm saying basically is that Quentin Tarantino is our Woody Guthrie. He is the Woody Guthrie of Mondo in the Midnight Movie. It's not a joke. Here's the most famous picture of Woody Guthrie. You see what he has written on his guitar, right? This machine kills fascists. I want you to think about the, about the fantasy that's communicated by that sentence. Because we're trying to make sense of this image. And that sentence provides the, the, the second important clarification. Woody Guthrie didn't just want to sing about justice. He didn't, he didn't just want to inspire his listeners or get them to raise their voices in the spirit of peace or whatever it is that we usually think folk singers do. He was trying to imagine a music so powerful that it would actually bring justice into the world. He wanted to strum justice into existence. Wanted an art that wouldn't just be in the service of revolution, but that would itself be the completed revolutionary act. And that's exactly what F Tarantino gives us at the end of the movie. This movie kills fascists. And, and the thing is, you, you might think that's a um, a peculiar fantasy of the 20th century's hard left. Uh, but it's not. That fantasy, the fantasy of a fully revolutionary art, turns out to be very old. As early as the 1590s, some English poets were trying to write plays that not only depicted revenge, but actually achieved it. They were trying to imagine plays that could actually kill corrupt courtiers and oppressive princes, as though blank verse could actually draw blood. 
Or if we flash forward to 1969, we'll find Amari Baraka writing these lines in a poem called Black Arts. We want poems that kill, assassin poems, poems that shoot guns, poems that wrestle cops into alleys and take their weapons, leaving them dead. OK. So Quentin is paying homage to the history of anti-fascist film. And he's also trying to imagine a movie that could not only describe justice, but actually achieve it. And of course, we need to put those points together and say that Tarantino is trying to imagine the perfect anti-fascist film. A film so righteously anti-fascist that it literally levels any fascist who wanders into its projected light. A film that fascists cannot watch. A film that turns fascists to dust. So maybe now we can say, or begin to say, why Tarantino has rewritten the history of 1944. And Glorious Bastards wants to give credit for the victory in World War II to someone other than the US and Soviet armies. To nominate as the virtual heroes of some secret history, badass Jews, and cinema itself. It's an extraordinary idea. Except I think that it's all wrong. None of what I've just said actually works. Or rather, the movie does in fact put in play the two fantasies I've been describing. It's the fantasy of a muscular Judaism and the fantasy of the perfect anti-fascist film. But then it takes them all back or at least makes them much, much harder to occupy. First, I think, it gets us to share those fantasies, and then it starts calling the fantasies into question. And you're going to want some evidence for that. I'll give you some evidence for that. There are two good reasons to think this. The first I'll mention only briefly and ask you to think about on your own time. One of the plain ways we have to describe who Shoshana is and what she does in this movie is to say that she's a suicide bomber. If you want to get fancy, you'll say that she's a 20th century Samson pulling the roof down on the heads of the Jews celebrating enemies. But if you go back and read the Samson story, you'll be forced to conclude before long that he too was a suicide bomber, so it's really the same point anyway. At this point, we'll have to recall that there was a bomb attack on a movie theater in northern India in 2007, another in Mumbai during the wave of coordinated attacks in 2009, and especially bad movie theater bombing in Algeria in 1998. I could go on. So the movie undoubtedly produces an image of a heroic Judaism, but only at the cost of letting it mutate visibly into one of its putative opposites, which is Muslim terrorism. So that's one of the big surprises hidden away in the movie's fantasies. The second surprise I'm going to give you in the form of a video montage. Can I put my own paraphrase to those images? So first we see a Nazi soldier shot from below, mowing down an improbable number of the gathered enemy. Then we see an American soldier doing the same thing and in an exceedingly similar shot. We see an American soldier mutilating an, en an enemy officer elsewhere in the movie and calling it his masterpiece. And if you pay attention to the subtitles in the film, you'll see Hitler telling Goebbels that he thinks that filmmaker has just made his masterpiece. In those last two shots, the stills, we see a fascist turn to the camera in black and white and address the audience directly, speaking English for the first time. And then we see the anti-fascists turn to the camera in black and white and address the audience directly, 
speaking English for the first time. You can see what this, up, what this adds up to. Tarantino has built in unmistakable visual rhymes between the fascist movie that the audience in the film is watching and its putatively anti-fascist alternatives. I just want to be clear here so we don't lose sight of some things. There are three movies that we have to take into consideration when we're deliberating on Inglorious Bastards. The movie we're watching, which is Tarantino's movie, the fascist movie, and Shoshana's anti-fascist film. So two anti-fascist movies and a fascist movie. And the point is that each of the two anti-fascist movies plainly, demonstrably resembles the fascist movie. Everything in the film starts <coughs> bleeding into fascism. You may not believe me on that, because it's it's a hard and uncomfortable point. So I'm going to give you two more examples to, to coax over the incredulous, OK? Um, uh, uh, some stills first. You, you won't have overlooked that in the movie, right? This is actually one of the very last things we see. It's uh, the Brad Pitt character carving a swastika with an oversized knife into Landis's forehead. But there's somebody else in the movie with that same knife who also carves the swastika. And it's Zola in the fascist movie. Another example, here's how the Brad Pitt character describes himself at the beginning of the film. Now I'm the direct descendant of the mountain man Jim Bridger. That means I got a little engine in me. And our battle plan will be that of an Apache resistance. So the American aligns himself with the Apache. I am Vinatu, chief of the Apaches. And the fascist aligns himself with the Apache. So look, what, what, what's true in miniature in these individual shots by individual shots <laughs> is also true globally in this film. The, the fascists are watching a patriotic war movie about the grotesquely exaggerated exploits of a national hero. And, and you can't even get that sentence out of your mouth without realizing that, yes, we too have been watching a patriotic war movie about the grotesquely exaggerated exploits of our national heroes. The anti-fascist movie we thought we were watching outs itself as fascism's secret twin. Now there's a lot to say here, but the short version is that I think we are in the presence of a filmmaker losing his confidence in Grindhouse as a people cinema and trying to find a way to make trash cinema yield a critique of itself instead. I think this all comes down to, a, to, to the audience. What I find most striking about the shots of the audience in Inglorious Bastards is how attentive they are to the immediate effects of screen violence upon a group of viewers. I mean, let me put it this way. I saw the movie twice in a theater, and both times I saw it, when the movie screen went up in flames, and the people in the cinema started dying, someone in the room, I mean the real room, the room I was in, clapped. Just a quick little <laughs> And then there's this. Watch the audience. Do you see the problem here? In the movie, we see one audience member laughing. And we get that shot of this one audience member laughing several times. Now I'm guessing many people here laughed during this film. And if, and if you weren't guffawing I'm, uh, and you saw it in the theater, I'm, I'm reasonably certain other people in the movie theater with you were having a gay old time. Now that gets at something important. Because as long as Tarantino has been making movies, high-minded critics have fretted that he makes violence entirely too pleasurable. All right, so Michael Madsen slices off a man's ear, and the audience are bopping in their seats because Stuck in the Middle with You is chiming on the soundtrack. Or you grin as Bruce Willis trades up from hammer, I'm gonna get this right, hammer to baseball bat to chainsaw to samurai sword. 
Right? So the only movie I've ever walked out on because of the audience, and not the movie, was the Coen Brothers' Blood Simple, which is close cousin to Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction. And I left that movie because the rest of my row was cracking up while Dan Hideo was getting buried alive, begging through mouthfuls of dirt. So how dare anyone find death funny? Now you have to imagine that Tarantino has always shrugged off that accusation. There are interviews that you can find on YouTube where he vocally and impatiently shrugs off that accusation. Except now he has conceded it. And how do we know he's conceded it? Here's the one person laughing in the audience. There's only one person laughing, and it's mother-loving Hitler. That's the sight of a filmmaker profoundly alienated from his own fans, wigging out at the ability of the movies he most loves to produce in us a quasi-fascist joy in violence. So why does Tarantino hate us so much? He hates us for liking his movies the way we do. He hates us because he can so easily bring us round to enjoying the sight of people being gathered into a closed space so that they can be exterminated. He hates you for how easily you can be pushed into the Nazi position so long as the people getting killed are themselves Nazis. He hates you because you are the fascist and you don't even know it. And he proposes the self-consuming grindhouse solution to this grindhouse dilemma, which is that people like you have to die. You will uphold your death sentence with your own applause. Are you going to clap? Thank you.